Um, at the end there is, is <clears throat> something for everyone, and, um, and I promised you by my title that love is a journey, so we're going to take a cruise today, um, but not that kind of a cruise. I think that, I mean, and you can tell just by the kinds of songs that Ray played for us today, as well as the 12 powers, and we have a brand new a banner over here that says, love moves into and flows out from my heart. We have many, many, many ideas and feelings about what love is. Love is a power. Love is a power that moves and it flows. Love is the answer. Love is what I am. Love stinks. Um, we all have different feelings about what love is. But most of them are ideas about love that are fairly new to humankind. Um, I, my degree's in paleontology and, and, and in archaeology, and I guarantee you I haven't earned a penny from those degrees. But I do know something about love as a journey. Um, Partially because as humans, we've been here, I don't know, some people think 5 million years, some people think 500,000 years, some people think 50,000 years, some people think 5,000 years, um, some people think we've only been around for five years. Um, I think that something's happening now that we're changing our ideas around who and what love is, partially because we're, we have the ability to go back in time. We do that through the archaeological record. We do that through DNA. We do that through all kinds of things that are available to us now that is forcing us to think about and feel about love differently. Typically, as Westerners, as Greco-Roman Hellenists, we think of love as a power. We think of love as a force. We think of love as something you can do and to give somebody. And we also think of it as a state of being. I am love. God is love. So we think of it as a noun or a verb. And I want to take you on a journey that begins at the source of the Nile, which is somewhere, because it has several sources, down by Ethiopia in the Nubian kingdom. And I say Nubian kingdom in quotes because before it was a kingdom, it was a queendom. There were no kings there. And out of that, Around a place called Lake Miro, there arose a kingdom that we call Nubia. And we know about it because the Egyptians tell us that all of the great kings come from there and that their old kingdom is the descendant of that Nubian kingdom. And in fact, the word for Egypt is Kemet or Kemet, and that means the black place. And the source of the Nile is where we got the pharaohs of Egypt. 
And the pharaohs of Egypt are really important to us because they announce the coming of man. Because up until that time when the kingdom of Nubia and other kingdoms like it sprung up in Africa, there were no kingdoms. There were no borders. There were no kings. Culture was based upon family. Culture was based upon villages. Culture was based upon very small ideas <clears throat> around what was sustainable. And so this is an archaeological idea that we're beginning to dig up now as we see that culture goes back before the ideas of kingdoms and borders. But there is one idea within this idea of kingdoms that has persisted with us. So in the area where the source of the Nile is, there was a deity, a goddess, a queen, but they didn't have those kinds of names for her. And so the Egyptians and the Nubians gave her a name. They called her Aset or Oset or Iset. And that meant the throne. That meant that it was she who gave the authority to the kings. The kings sat on her lap, and we know her in many, many, many different guises. Most of us know her as Isis, but her name Isis didn't come to much later. In the beginning, she was called Aset or Iset, and in the way of the ancient people, they never spelled her name because they didn't have that kind of literacy, but also when they did, it was forbidden to spell her name out. She was just referred to by the consonants of her name, in much the same way the Jews referred to Jehovah, only by the consonants of the name. That's a very, very ancient practice that predates Egyptians and it predates the Jewish practice of that. Why was that important? Because she was totally unknown. Like the Iami in the Yoruba religion and the ancient grandmothers in the Mayan uh, and the Toltec and the Inca religions, they believed that there were ancient grandmothers that were so old, so ancient, so amazing that they had no names. The word that these cultures, the Mayan culture, the Yoruba culture, the Egyptian culture, had for love is the same word they had for mystery, and it's the same word that they had for God. And at a time when God did not have a gender, he was simply awo in Yoruba, wakan in the Mayan language, and aset the word for love and the word for the deity was the same. The word for mystery was the same. There were things so old we just didn't know and we didn't have any kind of recording and we, didn't, we just knew that there was something way back then. And what we remember from that is what I want to talk about today. Because the idea of a kingdom moved up to Nubia. And the Nubians believed that they got their divine authority to be kings from this being. And they didn't even refer to it as a goddess or a being. They referred to it as the throne. And when the Nubians became the Egyptians and they moved north in what we call the Old Kingdom, this is like 5,000 years ago, they too 
believed in Aset or Oset. And they believed that their kings and their queens got their authority from her. And so, in order to understand what they believed about her at that time, we have to erase our idea about kings and queens and power and authority and borders. Because in the ancient Nubian kingdom, they had a memory of a time when there was no borders, when there was no power, when there was no authority, when there was no God. Because of the rise of kings arose at the same time as God arose. And in the same way, we saw kings as all-powerful. Our gods were all-powerful. Our gods became omniscient, omnipresent, and omnip omnipotent omnipotent, it meant that they became everything and they were somehow above us, separate from us. A set was not separate from us. This is important to today's theme because a set is also a word for love. And the idea of love, not as a noun, not as a verb, not as a journey, not as a destination, not as male, not as female, but as infinite and mysterious, and not just a state of being, but something that's unfathomable, unexplainable, and something that we only have little bits and pieces of, is what we are beginning to understand and realize that love is much bigger than we ever imagined, much older than we ever imagined, much less male than we ever imagined. And we anthropomorphize love. We give it a gender. We give it characteristics. We give it things to do. We give it things to be. We like to figure out what it looks like. <clears throat> love is me. Love is you. I use love. I give love. I take love. I, it's the like commodity. And that's a fairly modern thing, like modern being 5,000 years old. So let's move up the Nile. As we move up the Nile, we go to what we call the New Kingdom and the Egyptian heyday um, uh, when Egypt became like what Rome is uh, in most of our memories. You know, some of us remember Rome um, and some of us remember the Greco-Roman Empire and some remember the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire at one time stretched from Spain to uh, Anatolia, and all the way up to Finland, and all the way down to Nubia. And that was like around 300 BCE, or BC, if for those of us who still say it that way. Um, love, before those times, was the way that they also thought of as God. And as relationship. It wasn't until kings became men and gods became men that love became a thing, that love became a commodity, that love became a noun, that love became a journey. But before then, love was something that you experienced and you talked about but we didn't compartmentalize it the way that we do now. But that is changing. And that's what I want to talk about today. As we move up this journey, we come to, and if you're familiar with the Nile, 
all right? Not denial. If you're familiar with denial, then we need to talk a little more. But if you're familiar with the Nile, it's a river that snakes up through Africa. It goes north, and it terminates in a whole bunch of little rivers called the Delta. And so if you look at the Nile, it looks like a lotus flower. And when the kingdoms, the capital of Egypt, moved from Nubia, and it moved up to Thebes, and it moved to Acropolis, and it just kept moving up and up and up and up until finally it was at the mouth of the Mediterranean, the place where it came out, and it blossomed in many directions. And the history of Egypt is like that as well. In fact, if you take all of the capitals of Egypt, starting in Nubia, you'll see that there's seven of them, and they all match in nature the ages and the styles of what the chakra in the Mayan and the Hindu and in the Egyptian and the Yoruba cultures all believe. But at the mouth, when it becomes the delta and it branches out, the idea of gods and goddesses and kings branch out all over the world. So, as Christians, we think of the Israelites running away from Egypt and moving to Canaan, except at the time of Joseph and at the time of Moses, Canaan was a part of Egypt. Isis, during the time of Joseph, was also worshipped by the Babylonians worshipped by the, um, the, the Macedonians, worshipped by all kinds of cultures that all massed in the Delta, including the Jewish religion. In Judaism, women really weren't part of the religion. It was a man's religion. It was monotheistic. It was linear. It decided the politics, who was the king, Moses was, um, Moses was the, the Christ and, um, I mean, Aaron was the Christ and Moses was the Lord. And you had the political heads and you had the spiritual heads and they decided what the religion was. So women had another religion and their temples were in their tents and their temples were next to the temple. And so they had goddesses that had names like Asherah. And so if you think of Isis and you think of the period of time starting about 300 BCE, that's before Christ, if you're just a BC person, around 300 years before that, we start to see Estarte, we see Asherah, we see Isis, we see... Um, we see um, Yoster, we see all kinds of names that sound alike, and we call them the goddesses. But in the time, they did not think of them as religions and goddesses. They just thought of them as her. And they recognized each other's her. And we get the word Isis from the Greeks who all of a sudden take over Egypt. And so, and we don't think about that. Egypt was not always Egyptian. So when we think about Cleopatra, Cleopatra was a Greek woman and she was a, a, one of the Ptolemies. And when you think about the Ptolemaic pharaohs, they were all Greek, but they didn't come from the island of Greece. They came from the kingdom of Greece. All right, the island of Greece is not Greece. It's what's left of a giant empire. And that empire put its throne in Egypt. Why? Because the divine right of kings came up from the Nile, and whoever owned the throne of the Nile owned the world. The Greeks believed that. The Romans believed that. We believe that to this day, 
the kings of Europe, the queens of Europe, all trace their descendancy and their divine right to the Nile. And that's where power comes from. Next month, we're going to talk about power. This month, we're talking about love. What happened to that love? What happened to ISIS? Many of you know that there are people around the world that are called gypsies, all right? So I'm, I'm a gypsy. I'm from the Netherlands, and we're called Dark Dutch because we're Dutch, but we're really dark, you know? Um, it's because we come from India, and all of the gypsies come from the Sinti region of Pakistan or from India, and they were lepers that were driven out of India. And they also became Isis worshipers. So the word gypsy means that these were the followers of the Egyptian heresies. And the Egyptian heresies meant that you worshipped Isis, you worshipped Astarte, you worshipped Asherah, you worshipped all of these female gods that all were related and all were respected by all the different cultures of women amongst themselves. And it was so prevalent that when the Roman Empire finally became monotheistic and Christian and unified under a single male god and a single male Caesar, they had to get rid of all of these goddesses. And so they created the Egyptian heresies. And all around the Mediterranean, all the way to England, all the way to Spain, there is something called La Camina. And that's a road where all the black Madonnas live. Why? Because black Madonnas represented Isis, and she had on her lap the baby king Horus, who under Christianity became the mother Mary and the baby Jesus. This was totally wiped out, and these were heresies that were taken over or totally wiped out to the point that most of us don't know that the words Notre Dame, Our Lady, refers to the Black Madonna and not to the traditional biblical Mary and Jesus. And that the Church of Notre Dame is consecrated, consecrated to the Parisii. The Parisii, the, the, the inhabitants of the island of Paris, were pagans, Parisii means that they worshipped Isis and that on the site of their temple to Isis is where the Church of Notre Dame is built. And the statue of Notre Dame is a black woman on a throne holding a baby, a black baby with a crown. So what does that have to do with love? Our ideas of love are based upon fairly new ideas of things that have been brought to us by, by things like literacy, like the alphabet, like being able to represent things with symbols. And what happened was, was that by freezing things with numbers, with symbols, we also froze our ideas of God, of the connection we have with God. And we all of a sudden became from horizontal societies where everybody loved everybody and worshipped everybody else's gods and goddesses because they all thought of it as the same to a vertical societies where there's only one God. There's only one guy 
who can talk to God and only one guy who rules all of us because only he understands God because God only talks to him. And God is love and therefore he is love and he decides who we marry, where we live, what is our borders, and all of these guys who think that they have the divine right of kings given to them from the throne of Egypt for thousands of years, they all believe that they are the, the nexus to God. That they are God vicariously here on earth. They are vicars. And that's what vicar means. They are vicarious gods. The kings believed that they were the popes. The popes believed that he was the vicar of Christ. And that's the other thing. You see, the existence of a trinity has always been here. And right around 300 BCE, when the Nile journey hit the delta and the Greeks came down, they took those trinities and they said, Isis and Osiris and Horus are the father, the mother, and the son. Within 300 years, soon after the birth of Christ, and not just in Christianity, but in Judaism, in the Greco, um, what we call heathenism, and in the Roman paganism, the God, the Son, and Sophia, our word for wisdom, Sophia disappeared and was replaced by the Holy Spirit. In the Roman religion, God, Yahweh, Jesus, the Son, and Isata, the mother. They erased the mother. Isata literally meant the love of God. And within a few hundred years, they made it like she was God's love, like she was the consort of God. She was the woman that God loved. And then she became excised, replaced by a Holy Spirit, who was amorphous, had no gender, and became the new part of the Trinity. Love has been erased from our memory, except as something that we do, something that we get, something that we give, and sometimes something that we are, or our concept of God. So we have spiritual love, and we have romantic love that comes to us from the Romans because the Romans put an emphasis on the idea of love between a man and a woman, but mostly as chattel. <laughs> so romantic love is a man owns a woman. And we have those ideas to this day. Spiritual love, romantic love. But I want you, before we move into meditation, consider that love is much grander than that. Love is much more mysterious than that. And love is your mother. That the idea of a love that we experience and that we see in the animal world, the love of a mother, is the very often overlooked idea of what love is. And since we all have mothers, and so some of us are mothers, there is something within the mystery of that. And before we move into meditation and move into the next month where we start to consider power, I want you to consider the idea that you just don't know what love is, that love is mystery, that love and God is synonymous, 
and that you are the part of God that you need to understand, but you are also the part of love that you need to understand. And as you grow, as you express yourself, as you discover yourself, you share one piece of God and one piece of love to the rest of us, to the rest of the world. I believe that we're moving back into a period where we may be separated again for a period of time. And I think every time we go through these times of plague and pandemic, and we find ourselves alone or in our small little pods of our little families, as horrible as it is, these are the times we have to assess within ourselves what it is that we are and we believe and that we express about what God is. And I want to just suggest that we do not forget that God is not an old white-haired man up there and that God does not have a girlfriend named Isada or Sophia that these things that were once joined were separated so that we could all understand them because we identify as a woman or we identify as a man or we identify as a child. But if you notice, those lines are blurring. They're blurring every day and it's only happened within the last few years and it will continue to happen. We are in the midst of a revolution of our understanding and our belief about God, about politics, about kings, about borders, but mostly about love. And so as we go through the rest of the month and everybody gives you their take on love, I want you to have that as a subtext underneath. That love is a mystery but you know some of the mystery. We just don't talk about it anymore. So if I could get you to close your eyes. Hey, Ray, can I get you to give us a little meditation music? It's okay not to know. The idea of mystery, the idea of the unfathomable, the idea of the unknown, the idea of the source being so long ago, so far away, so physically unavailable to us that we simply can't even know what it is. I want you to consider that those ancient grandmothers that birthed us still care for us, are still with us, that we are still a part of them, and that as we look at those things that we have added to our definitions of God, like the maleness of God, or the supremacy of our last name and our family through our father's lines and all kinds of things that we've added on consciously and unconsciously. That there are things that transcend that. Things that as we discover in our DNA that there are matrilineal parts of each cell that are inviolable to mixing and go on in infinity to the points that we can actually identify where the 500 great-grandmothers that we all share used to live. And all the way down to the three or four great-grandmothers that used to live south of there. We don't know their names. 
We don't know their faces, what they did. But what we do know is they birthed us and that each loved their children and that each of their children had children all the way to who we are now. And since we don't remember them, it's hard to say not to forget them. But we have to remember them. And by not forgetting them, I mean to simply acknowledge their existence and how important they are. Not more important than the patrilineal lines, but I want us to remember that at one time they embodied love before we brought all of these other ideas and images and beliefs to replace the love of a mother. Namaste. I thank you for all of your time and listening to me. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Ray.